Okay, folks. So today we're going to continue our discussion of Dirac equation. And the reason we like the Dirac equation is because it gives us spin antiparticles and the G factor too. I forgot to mention that. You know, the little guy who says G equals two, remember that for spin? You know, we say that magnetic moment is equal to G Q over two M S. And for electron, then G equals two. Remember that little formula? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll derive that today. Um, okay, folks, so you can hear me okay, is that right? Yes. Okay, all right, so let's, okay, so let's go. So I introduced this last time. Um, I'll sort of remind you what we did just because uh, you know, it's a new thing. Um, and so let's just sort of remind ourselves of, let's sort of like go through the reasoning of the Dirac equation without doing all the algebra, but sort of step through the reasoning a little bit. So the idea uh, is that we have the old non-relativistic Schrodinger equation that you spent the last year figuring out, which is H psi equals E psi, our old friend, but we're H for, and, and we're just gonna worry about free particles for now. And, and the Hamiltonian for free particle is just kinetic energy, P squared over two M, but we know that we can replace P with uh, in quantum mechanics, H bar over I del, because the observable turns into an operator. Um, and so then this becomes negative h bar squared over 2m del squared psi. And then the e part here, we turn into a time derivative, i h bar d dt. And so I get i h bar d dt psi. So that's our old friend, time dependent Schrodinger equation. But then we look at that and we say, oh no, this is terrible. Something terrible is happening. Uh, this is a second derivative, whereas this is a first derivative. And so that means that's bad for relativity. It's not covariant. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't treat time and space on the same foot, footing. We need time and space to be treated the same. And they're not, so something's obviously screwed up. So uh, what Dirac did is he said, well, I, um, I really like the formalism of quantum mechanics and so let's keep it, but how can I get time and space on the same footing? He said, well, if I'm gonna keep H psi equals E psi, and if E is gonna give me H I H bar D D T, then H has to give me del, right? Um, to the to the first power. So he just said, let's just make. He just said, let's. He said, let's just make the assumption. He said, let's let's just assume that the Hamiltonian for a free particle is proportional. 2p. That's it. That's the whole thing. So simple. That's what I love about the Dirac equation. The, the, con the idea is just so simple. He said, Hamiltonian has to be proportional to momentum. And where does that take me? So if the Hamiltonian is proportional to momentum, that means I can write it as a some constant times momentum plus some constant. But then you realize, okay, hold on a second. You know, energy is a scalar. Momentum is a vector. So, you know, we got to play around with the math a little bit to make it work. And so you go, okay, well, what's the most general way to write this linear equation? Well, the most general way is to say that the Hamiltonian is equal to some vector dotted with P. I need to do that to make it a scalar plus some uh, other constant or call it beta 
but to make the units work out, let's just call this beta mc squared, and let's put a little c there. That way we don't have to put units into the alpha and the beta. That way they can be unitless. Um, okay, so then we have uh, that. Um, and, um, and so that's the, and so he said, let's just assume, and this is just an assumption. He said, let's assume it has this form. And then he said, okay, you know, if it has that form, then alpha is some vector that is not known. And it's just a very general operator. And P is our old friend, we know him, but we don't know alpha. So the question is, what is alpha and what is beta? So to find out what those guys are, he said, well, let's just plug it in and see what happens. So he said, I know that uh, H psi equals E psi. So if I hit it twice, I get H squared psi equals E squared psi. And so here we'll just plug in H equals uh, this alpha dot P, um, C alpha dot P, am I getting these units all correct? Yeah, uh, plus beta MC squared. And for E, we know that E squared equals P squared C squared plus M squared C to the fourth from relativity. That's our old friend that we all learned from relativity, uh, special relativity. And then you plug it in, you plug it in, and from that, then you get some mathematical constraints. And we did, I did all the algebra last time. I'm not gonna do it again, it was so tedious, but you do get some mathematical constraints. And then from these mathematical constraints, you say the only way that these constraints can be solved is, is to say, uh, well, it's not the only way, it's not unique, but the simplest, the simplest solution, the lowest dimensional solution, the simplest solution that solves those constraints is this. I need that alpha and beta become four by four matrices. And that's pretty clever. You know, that requires some mathematical sophistication to recognize that, but it's not like so hard, you know, you could do it. You can step through the logic. Uh, it's not like beyond you. <laughs> Um, and then, um, um, and then, and then he said, "Well, which which matrices solve those constraints?" And he basically solved it. He saw he he was able to find that beta has to equal one, one minus one minus one, and then zeros everywhere else. Alpha x had to equal um, one, 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 and zeros everywhere else and alpha y had to equal um, i minus i, i minus i, and zeros everywhere else. And alpha z had to equal um, 0, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, um, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, 0. All right, so I'm, I'm doing shorthand. I just don't want to draw all those zeros. It's just so much writing. And so the more compact notation is to say that beta is equal to I, zero, zero, I, and alpha is equal to zero, sigma, sigma, zero, where sigma, where I, is equal to the unit identity, two by two identity matrix. And sigma is our old friend, the poly matrices. Right? Okay. So, and, and, and so you can derive this, like you can follow this logic, you know, every step you guys can do. Um, and so then um, we have the, uh, the new Schrodinger equation. So the new the new relativistic Schrodinger equation, relativistic Schrodinger equation, which we now call the Dirac equation, 
uh, is going to be h psi equals e psi. But now where h is c alpha dot p um, plus theta mc squared psi equals e psi. And that's the, uh, the new Hamiltonian. And that's it. So, and alpha is well-defined. It's it, it, alpha is in terms of the Schro uh, poly matrices. Beta is well-defined, it's all soft. So that's our new uh, Schrodinger equation. Now it's pretty weird looking, you know, you look at that and you go, oh my God, you know, it doesn't give you the intuition that you already have for the old Schrodinger equation. So if you're like a high energy physicist or, or some condensed matter physicist you, and you need this equation, <laughs> you're gonna have to develop a new intuition. And that's just the way it goes. It's not, it's not a bad thing. It's good to learn new things. Um, just hard, that's all. And so when you look at this, then, but then nobody said physics would be easy. So, but you look at this equation and then you notice that this is a four by four matrix. And so if that's a four by four matrix, because, you know, alpha and beta are four by four matrices. So how, how does this equation even make sense? It, it, the only way it can make sense is that we have to have that the wave function is a four dimensional vector, a four tuple. That's what they do in math, they call it, you know, tuples. This is a, a four tuple. So, um, it's just a vector, okay, a four-dimensional vector. So it, so you need a four-dimensional vector. Now, I, I want you to appreciate that when Dirac was doing this, he did not know what that four-dimensional vector is. I mean, like, what do those dimensions represent? What is the meaning, the physical meaning of those dimensions? I just want to uh, impress upon you that it's not obvious. We're just following the math and, and the, the wave function has to have four dimensions, but what do those dimensions physically represent is not obvious. And it was not obvious to Dirac either. So, but Dirac just kept cranking. He just kept cranking on the math just to see where it would lead him. Because if we just keep going, maybe it will start to become, maybe it will start to make sense if we just keep going. So let's keep going. <clears throat> um, okay, so let's just keep going. So we don't know what those four dimensions mean, but we're like, okay, let's let's keep going. So so maybe the maybe the most straightforward thing to do is is to simply solve it. Let's solve the equation and see what it gives us. But what does it mean to solve the equation? What it means is let's find these components: psi one, psi two, psi three, psi four. Let's figure out what they equal, and maybe that'll help us out. So to do that, let's make an assumption. Let's assume that the solution has this form. Let's assume it has some scalars, A1, A2, A3, A4. And to make the math easier, because we think that we have some intuition here, we think that there'll be a plane wave. So it'll be a plane wave multiplying this four vector. So let's assume that we have this type of a solution, form, of solution, and then let's plug it in. Then we plug it into the Dirac equation. And I did this last time, but it's a bunch of math, you know, and it's easy to get lost in the math. Then you plug into the Dirac equation and then you get an eigenvalue problem. Just like all the eigenvalue problems that you've ever solved and you have solved many. It's just a standard eigenvalue problem. And so the eigenvalues, this is, and this is the eigenvalue problem, H psi equals E psi. And that's the eigenvalue. And so when you solve the eigenvalue problem, which we did in class, then you see that the eigenvalues are this. You find that E equals plus or minus square root of T squared, C squared, plus M squared, C to the fourth. And it was not hard. It was just some tedious algebra, but it was not hard. You guys can do it. It's not beyond you. And so there's two eigenvalues.
which we'll call plus and minus. And so then what we did was we, uh, we see that E plus is square root of, is plus square root of P squared C squared plus M squared C to the four. And E minus is equal to minus square root of P squared C squared plus M squared C to the four. And that's just what the math gives us. So it's just math and it's straightforward. And so, you know, there's nothing tricky there. That's what the math gives us. And so then what we want to do is find the eigenvectors. We got the eigenvalues. Now we find the eigenvectors. And what that means is we have to solve for A1, A2, A3, and A4. And we just do that in the normal way just by, uh, to, to do that, what you do is the standard thing is you plug the eigenvalues back into the matrix equation, into the matrix equation, which you've all done a hundred times or at least 30 times. So you plug the eigenvalues back into the matrix equation and solve. Uh, and when you do that, this is what you get. Let's, let's to, to find the answers, let's take the non-relativistic limit. Just to make the math simpler, I actually gave the general solution, but let's take the non-relativistic limit, which means that um, the energy is much less than mc squared, the rest mass energy. And when you take the non-relativistic limit, then what you find is for, um, the positive energy solution, m squared c to the fourth, um, for the positive one, then you get these solutions. You get psi one plus is equal to one zero 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 e to the i k dot r and you get psi two plus equals zero, one, zero, zero, e to the i k dot r. And you think, and you look at that and you go, well, what the hell does that mean? Well, look, this is what it means. It's just your old friend spin. That's spin up times e to the i k dot r. And then this guy is your old friend, your old friend, spin down, e to the i, k dot r. You have just derived spin, <laughs> but the math is like so weird, you know, it's hard to get an intuition. We will actually get a better intuition for this uh, in a few minutes when we when we go beyond this. When we let's add it, what we'll do next is we'll add a magnetic field, and then you'll see the spin. Will may, I think it'll make some more sense. But then you, but then you. Um, but then you, you ask, have to ask yourself, what about these negative energy solutions? P squared, C squared plus M squared, C to the fourth. Well, those guys are similar. I have my negative energy solution, zero, zero, one, zero, E to the I, K dot R. And I have my second negative energy solution which is going to be zero, 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 one, e to the i, k dot r. And this, of course, is nothing, nothing more than spin up for negative energy particles times a plane wave. And this is nothing more than spin down. But I'll put a little minus sign because it's for negative energy particles. And now you see what all those dimensions are. The, the dimensions, these four dimensions, you have because now you now you get now you get a sense of what is going on because the wave function is a one, a two, a three, a four, and this is this tells me the amplitude for spin up positive energy, spin down 
positive energy, but this is the amplitude for spin up for a negative energy particle. And this is the amplitude of spin down for a negative energy particle. So my wave function can have spin up and spin down components for positive energy, but also can have some negative energy components as well. And, um, and so you're, you guys have already, you guys already know about the positive energy solution. So the new part that's confusing is the negative energy solutions. So, uh, but I, I just want you to see that uh, if I look at the positive energy solutions, like if I, for example, if I say, for, look at this, if I say that psi is equal to A, B, um, um, <clears throat> what if I did like this? If I said, you know, zero, zero, um, then what I can do is I, this would then be, um, that's just that's just your old friend, your old spin, your old friend, which is uh, spin up, part spin up, part spin down. And now I've uh, given this, so this is some arbitrary state that I just created here. So this is like, let's say that this is just some arbitrary energy greater than zero state. Uh, then I, um, then, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just, this is just telling me how much of the spin up component I have and how much of the spin down component I have. So these, these, um, these coefficients in this four dimensional vector are just telling us how much spin up and spin down component we have for the positive energy and negative energy components of our wave function. Okay, so how do we interpret this? Let's interpret it further because this is telling us something very strange because we see that we have the positive energy solutions, and we have the negative energy solutions. And so what does this mean, positive energy and negative energy? It kind of makes no sense. So what we can do is we just, let's just plot it out. We got these two functions, that one and that one. So let's just plot them. And let's, let's replace, we'd like to, I mean, we like to think and we like to talk in terms of uh, momentum. When we talk about momentum, we like to use k. So let's 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 uh, for notation. Let's just call p equals h bar k. All right. So then that means that this becomes uh, um, h bar squared k squared, etc. And so what we see then is we can, if we want to plot this out then let's plot it like this, energy K, all right? And so what we see then is, you know, E plus or minus is equal to plus or minus square root of H bar squared, K squared, C squared, plus M squared C to the fourth. Now let's plot this function over here. And when we plot it, we're gonna, you see that when K is zero, then what does the energy equal to when K is zero? So in other words, I have a particle, a positive energy particle that has zero momentum. What's its energy? Look at that. Say again? Rest mass. Exactly, mc squared. But what if I have a negative energy particle? Because there's two functions to plot. You know, I got the positive energy function, but I also got the negative energy function. What happens if I have a negative energy particle with zero momentum? What energy does he have? Tell me. Negative mc squared? Yeah, exactly. It's not hard. It's just right there in the equation. Perfect. That's exactly right. And so now let's plot these functions. And so when I plot them, they're, you know, they look a little funny, but they're kind of like, they're sort of like a parabola, like a distorted parabola when you plot them. So let's just plot it like this. 
you know, go on mathematic and plot those functions and you'll see what they look like, but they look something like this. Okay. And so this is E plus, which is a function of K. And this is E minus, which is a function of K. And the functions are just right over here on the right. Okay, so I've plotted it. Okay, now what does this mean though? What, what, does, it, what does it mean? So let's ask ourselves what this means because let's think about this for a second. I got this positive parabola and I got this negative parabola. So that's my plus mc squared and that's my minus mc squared. This is E versus K. Now, let's do like you, the top parabola, the top parabola should sort of make sense to you because it kind of reminds you of your old friend, um, your, your, it reminds you of your old friend, you know, E equals H bar squared K squared over 2M, right? P squared over 2M, you know, kinetic energy. So it should look kind of familiar. So the top parabola kind of makes sense. And when the momentum is zero, then all your energy is in the rest mass. So it, the top parabola kind of makes sense. But it's that bottom parabola that should be kind of freaking you out. You're like, what the hell is that? I've never seen that before. There is not a bunch of negative energy states. That makes no sense. And this is why it doesn't make sense. Because look, if I put a particle here, right here, boop, I can put a particle into this state right there. Let's put them right there. That means that this particle has this much energy. I'll just call it K prime. I put a particle there, it has that much momentum, K prime, it's living in that state. Kind of made it an ugly dot. Let's, let's put it again. So it's just right there, okay? I'm living in that state. What, and so that particle is just happily, you know, moving along. It, it, it has some plane wave nature, E to the I, k prime dot r, there it is, I drew it. It's a plane wave moving to the right, this, this state right here. Okay, so that, par that particle has some energy, it has momentum, it's just a happy, happy little particle, little electron just moving along like you've done before and like you've studied before in class. Now, if there's no perturbations, nothing happening, then that particle, well, I'll ask you, will that particle change? Will its state change if there's no perturbations? Tell me, yes or no? No. That's right, good, because it's a stationary state. It's an eigenstate. Eigenstates are stationary states. Stationary means not changing. That's exactly right. But now let's turn on a perturbation, okay? Let's say that there's a butterfly in South America that flaps its wings, flap, flap, flap. It flaps its little wings and it creates a perturbation. <clears throat> All right, and so there's always a perturbation. You know, some, some little perturbation happens. So now you know from perturbation theory and Fermi's golden rule and all that stuff that we study in this class, you know that that particle can now change its state. It can now couple to all the other eigenstates. So, so normally that particle would, you know, particles like to fall down in energy. So one thing that the particle could do is it could fall down, boom, to here, and then boom, to here. But normally the lowest energy could go is right there. So in principle, that particle could fall down to the lowest energy state, and then it would have to give off photons. It could, you know, it would radiate the energy. All right, that's a very normal thing. You radiate the energy. Uh, we sort of discussed it, although, you know, to, to, to fully treat that, you need um, field theory and second quantization and all this. So we didn't, you know, we didn't really talk about radiation so much, but we talked about how, you know, the radiation field couples to the uh, particle and the energy can go back and forth. So that should sort of make sense. And then no, under normal conditions, the particle would just stop because it's like I have a ball it's up on top of a hill, I let it go, it rolls down the hill, it gets to the bottom and, and it stops, it can't go any lower, that's normal. But now if we have these negative energy states, 
what will the particle do? That butterfly in South America just keeps flapping its wings, flap, flap, flap. It's just, it's just having fun. It's flapping its wings. So that little particle keeps getting perturbed by the butterfly. So, so norm, so normally in your, in the old way of thinking that electron would just stay there because it's at the lowest energy. Maybe the butterfly would give it some energy and push it up a little higher in energy. That could happen. But now, because we have negative energy states, something else can happen. Tell me what happens. Well, it could, uh, like, I feel like you want us to say that it could get to a negative energy and go to the bottom curve, but would that be like, like sort of like, like a tunneling effect or something like that to a different energy state or? Well, no. Uh, well, I mean, tunneling is not quite, I mean, tunneling, Tunneling is a word that we use, you know, we use the word tunneling when we're talking about going when, when there's a potential and the particle's energy is less than the potential and then the particle moves into a classically forbidden region. So that's, that's when we use tunneling, you know, and so that's not what's really going on here. What we have here are eigenstates. So, so what, the way to think of it now is it's more like, remember those old discussions that we had in this course a few weeks ago or a month ago or whenever it was, but we're talking about perturbation theory and time dependent perturbation theory. We're talking about transitions. That's what, that's what I want you to be thinking of. I want you to be thinking in terms of transitions, you know, cause we talked about how if I have a bunch of eigenstates and there's a perturbation, then the perturbation couples me to all those states. Remember I have like the green goo and all the it sprays all over. I have now amplitude to be in all these other states. That's, that's sort of the thinking I want you to be doing now. Which, which is how you are thinking. So you were saying it, but you know, I just want to, I want to get us all on the same page. So, so now I have all these states because these are states. You know, they're all states and these are states. They're all states. That's what these curves represent, eigenstates, you know. And so now I'm, I'm in this state and now there's a perturbation. So that means now I can couple to this state. So it's just what you said. I can go down. Now, when I go down, let's say, let's talk about electrons, okay? If I go from this state to that state, I've changed my energy by how much? Tell me, what's the number? Two mc squared. That's right. And, and what is it numerically for an electron? Does anybody remember? How many electron volts? A thousand mega electron volts. Say it again, please. A thousand mega electron volts. Um, a, 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 a thousand kilovolts. Kilovolts, sorry. Yeah, a thousand kilovolts, exactly. That's right. A thousand kilovolts, which is a megavolt. It's a million electron volts. How many electron volts does a typical electron in a piece of silicon, you know, like this, the electrons that make your iPhone work? You know, your iPhone is full of silicon. There's electrons in the silicon. They move around. That's how your iPhone works. That's how technology works. It's electrons moving around in silicon. How much energy do those electrons have that are moving around in silicon that make your iPhone work? Tell me, what's the number? One keV. Good guess, and thank you for trying. Uh, that's that's a good guess. But no, they they have even less. One electron volt. Now you can make kilovolt electrons. Like let's say that you wanted to make x-rays you know like let's say that you go to the doctor's office and you want to get an x-ray so then the doctor sticks you in the room and he has some machine with the, some bulb or i don't know some x-ray machine what that x-ray machine is doing it's a, it's shooting kilovolt electrons like what you just said at some target and then that's causing photons kil that causes kilovolt photons to be irradiated and a kilovolt photon is an x-ray so so we do have machines where we have kilovolt electrons, but that's, those are usually used to generate x-rays. But if it, but in a piece of, uh, a piece of high technology with little circuitry, the electrons have much less energy because they're just moving around, you know, quite rapidly, but still even a fast moving electron in your iPhone has only one electron volt of energy. So I just want to impress upon you that this is a hell of a lot of energy. It's 1 million electron volts. Uh, so, so the, and that means that if you if it falls, that means it's going to radiate a photon gamma. 
and that photon will have a that will be a, a gigantic X-ray with like lots of energy, you know, uh, a megavolt uh, photon. That's a badass photon. That's a lot of energy. Um, okay, but then, but then the electron won't be content to stop there because that butterfly in South America just keeps flapping its wings. It just won't stop. It's just, you know, a hyperactive little butterfly. And so what does this electron do? He keeps getting perturbed by that butterfly. So it just fell and emitted a megavolt photon. What, but now what does he do? He's not done. What does he do? He's not done. He's only just begun. What does he do? Someone tell me. It's gonna keep rolling off the hill. Yeah, he keeps falling because he has more states. He just keeps falling. He just keeps falling and falling and falling. See, you know who this is? You know Max who that is? Demon. What? Who's that? Maxwell's demon. <laughs> no, even worse. <laughs> Maxwell's demon, that's a good one. No, that's the devil. Because that electron falls all the way to hell. All the way, all the way down. And as he's falling, he's screaming. Ah, no, this can't be happening. Not me, I was a good electron. So he keeps emitting these photons and he just emits photons that have infinite energy and he falls all the way to hell. And it's like, oh my God, you know, uh, that's quite dramatic, you know? And so this is what Dirac derived, okay? So this is the consequence of, the, of, what, of all of this math that we just did. What this math is telling us is that all the electrons in the world should just fall straight to hell and emit infinite energy photons. In other words, the universe should explode pow, in this gigantic bright flash of light, x-rays. Um, and so that's what this says, okay? And so Dirac did this math and he went through all this reasoning. He looked at this and he, and he came to the exact same conclusion that we just came to. And, uh, and but then he looked around and he noticed that the electrons were not falling to hell. They were not falling all the way down to hell. They were not. And the universe, he noticed that the universe was not exploding all around him. And so, and so he thought, and he thought, you know, he's like, okay, hold on a second. You know, he, he's, he's like a super smart guy. So he knew that his math was correct. All his equations were perfect because the guy's like a mathematical genius. So he knew, he knew everything he did was right. And he knew these equations had to be right. But he looked at the, he looked at the results and it said that the universe should explode. And all the electrons should fall down, you know, all the way down to negative infinity. And uh, and so he was like, okay, that can't happen. I know the equations are right. I know the math is right. But I also know that the electrons cannot keep falling down to negative infinity. So something else must be happening. Uh, and this was his, <laughs> he came up with another brilliant idea, which some of you might know already, but it's the kind of thing that you wouldn't just think of on your own unless someone tells you. Does anybody know what the solution to this paradox is? What, what was the solution that Dirac came up with to solve this problem? Didn't he call it like an electron C or something? That's right, the Dirac C. Do you remember what that is? Wasn't it like all the lower energy states are already occupied by like a sea of electrons, so they that's can't fall by Pauli exclusion? Perfect. That's exactly right. That's perfect. And it's like, who would have thought of that? You know, it's like, oh my God. You know, so so what Dirac said was, these states must be filled. It's such a simple idea. It's just so brilliant. He just said, all these states are filled already. These states must already be filled by electrons. So, you know, I have like a big box, the universe is a box and there's like all those possible momentum states an electron can have. And he was saying, okay, all of these momentum states must be filled with electrons. So, so the negative energy states must be filled. And 
it's exactly what you just said. And therefore, those electrons cannot fall down because those states are already occupied and the Pauli exclusion principle forbids them to, uh, be, you know, to be doubly occupied. And so this we call the Dirac C. And so the idea is that there's this sea of negative energy particles all around us. And as we walk, we're just moving through a sea of negative energy particles. <laughs> but we cannot give any energy to them because they're, the states are all filled. They got nowhere to go. They have nowhere to go. And so that's why when you walk, you don't feel them. You know, you're not bumping into them because they, they have nowhere to go. You cannot give them energy because where would they go? Wait a second. Maybe they do have somewhere to go. Doesn't does an electron down here in the negative energy C, does it have somewhere to go? Could I give it some energy and make it go somewhere? Tell me. Can it go up again? Why not? Of course, why not? It's an electron. It's an electron like any other electron. It's it's, it's an electron, you know? It's not, uh, it's not some weird, it's not an antiparticle. We haven't got to antiparticles yet. It's an electron. These are electrons occupying negative energy states. Those electrons are the same as any electron, as the electrons that make up your body, you know, in molecules. It's the same type of electron. So you're absolutely right. If there's an electron down there, why can't I give it energy and put it into one of those positive energy states? So yeah, that's exactly right. In principle, I could take this electron and I could make it go there. You see what I'm saying? It's like, I have to keep drawing this, this, this thing again. Here I go like this. So these states are all filled. And so I have all these filled states. And what is stopping me from making this electron go here? But if that electron goes there, uh, can't erase it. Okay, if that electron goes there, then what he's going to leave behind is a hole, an empty spot, right? Because the, the, these states are all filled, but now I, I removed an electron and I put him up there. How much energy do I need to give that electron to, to put him up there? How much energy? Tell me the number. One MeV. That's right. So the idea then, and this was Dirac's idea. Dirac said, okay, look, all those negative energy states have to be filled with electrons. Otherwise the universe would explode. It's obviously not exploding. So that's gotta be. And then he said, but hold on a second. If all those electrons are there and, they, and they're electrons, they, they are actual real electrons, then I should be able to excite them. I should be able to take one of those negative energy electrons and excite it up and make a positive energy electron out of it. And the way that I should be able to do that is with a, by giving it 1 million electron volts, all right? And, uh, and then if I do that, then I should have a positive energy electron, right? But then I have a hole here. I have all those negative energy electrons, but one is missing. That's a hole. We call that a hole. And I think the terminology is sort of obvious why we use that terminology. What is that hole? It is a missing negative energy electron. What the hell is that thing? What do I call it? Does anybody know? Is that a positron? Or? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's what we call it. And that, my friend, is the antiparticle. Right. That's the antiparticle. It's not the negative energy electron. That's not the antiparticle. It's the, <laughs> it's the missing negative energy electron. That is the antiparticle. Because that hole, it can move around. It can, it's a thing, it can move around. 
and it has, and the energy of it, I'm sorry, the, the charge, it moves around and it has charge. It has, uh, the char it has charge opposite the electron charge. So um, an electron, an electron has charge negative E, but a positron has charge plus E. And this is something that you learn in solid state physics. This is a, a it's, it's actually a very simple thing to understand, although it, it takes a few lines of algebra, so I, won't, I can't derive it here, but it's something that you learn in, for example, Physics 141A, Introductory to Solid State Physics. It's actually very straightforward to show that if you have a filled up C of negative energy particles, uh, of negative electron, negative charged particles, if I pluck one out and create a hole, then that hole behaves like a, um, like a positively charged particle. And this is actually a very common concept in solid state physics, and it's used in semiconductor devices because you have, in semiconductor devices, you have what you, we call the conduction band, and we call, have what we call the valence band. And the mathematical structure of solid state physics actually mimics the structure of the Dirac equation. There's, there's sort of like a one-to-one -one correspondence, or, or not exactly, you know, it's, there's, there's a few details there. But I just want to say that these concepts of like a hole and a missing electron, it actually, it, 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 we can actually create that same kind of scenario in a chunk of silicon. Because I can pluck an electron out of the valence band of silicon, leaving behind a hole. And that hole acts like a positively charged electron, like, like it's, it acts like a particle. And so that's a familiar concept, but I'm not going to derive why, why that works. Maybe I think it might feel intuitive to you if you just think about it, but it, you can put it on firm mathematical footing, but to do that, I would have to like, you know, teach a solid state physics course, which in fact I am doing <laughs> next semester. I'm teaching solid state physics. I just found out yesterday. Um, okay. okay. Um, and so um, we, okay, so we have the whole. And so now, yeah. I have a question. Um, yeah. I didn't really catch where we started assuming or that the particle that we've been dealing with was a fermion? Well, we're talking about electrons. Yeah, but what happens if it's a boson? But this um, Dirac equation is general, right? For that's a good, that's a really good question. So let's go back a little bit. Okay. Okay, here. Uh, see this, you see this here? See how I said simplest solution, right? Okay, it turns out that there are other solutions. For example, there could be a, um, uh, there could be, for example, a six by six matrix. This matrix is a four by four matrix because that means there's two positive energy solutions and two negative energy. That corresponds to spin one half. What, what would it correspond to if I had a six by six matrix? Spin one? Yeah, three up, three down. Because spin one is, is plus one, zero, minus one. There's three states. So you, you see you can start constructing uh, you can, using this type of formalism, you can start constructing uh, Schrodinger equations for higher spin particles, but then, the, but then the alphas and the beta matrices will change. So you can actually incorporate higher different spins. Okay, and, and so that's like the answer to your question. So, so we did the simplest one. So we did the simplest one, which was four by four, and that turns out to represent the spin one half particle. Okay, which is which is a fermion. Okay, um, so if we decided to use six by six matrix, then, um, then yeah, I can't it. really think of yeah, um, I can't do the math real quick. But can we 
do we still have the negative energy states or if we did then poly exclusion exclusion principle wouldn't work that's a good point on. yeah you're, you're totally right that's a good point so um i've never seen that you know worked out uh, and and so what really happens is that you know in modern physics like if you you know take you know graduate like field theory there's other ways of treating the quantum mechanics there's some more modern treatments so this treatment that i'm showing you is sort of like a very um you know archaic way of looking at it and it wor works quite nicely for spin one half but to start making a more generalized formalism uh what what the modern treatment is, is what the modern treatment is is to use field theory and so uh, I think that you don't want to push on this formalism too hard. I think it's it's not worth it. If you want to go further, you'll you'll learn field theory. Okay. Okay. And yeah. and, and and you know and and I have never seen that problem dealt with. You know, like I have never seen like anyone like solve that problem that you just raised. You know, in the Dirac equation and work through all the details. So I actually don't have a good answer for you other than to say that you know, field theory is, is like, you know, how people actually treat real particles that have different spin and, you know, all, all of this kind of physics is incorporated. Sorry, um, one more theory. quick question. So I'm not very aware of um, antiparticles, but are all the antiparticles fermions? No, no. I mean, if you have a, if you have some boson antiparticle, then I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, a fermion. Yeah, I, I don't think that's the case. Okay. Um, but in my world, you know, like I, I don't, in, you know, in my world, I don't deal a lot with antiparticles, you know, because I'm a condensed matter physicist, so we don't, uh, it's not as common in solid state physics to have to deal with that. Although it does happen, but it's not as common. Um, I, uh, I actually am trying to learn about it in my own research, right, these days. Um, okay, but let's not get into those details. So. But the point I just want to make is that it, it, in principle, you can excite the electron from the negative energy state into the positive energy state. And so what that means, it, it, think about it, is that if you could have a photon, suppose this is a photon that has 1 million electron volts. That's a photon. That photon is just traveling along, happily traveling along. Now, what if that photon were to hit that negative energy particle? then that means that that photon could create, that photon could be absorbed, you know, by this negative energy guy right here. And if he absorbs him, he could get kicked up to here and leave behind a hole. And so what that means is that a photon can create an electron and a hole. So that means that this is allowed. It also means that you could do it. Like if you took your hand, if you could move your hand so fast that you could impart 1 million electron volts of energy to an electron, you could actually create positrons with your hand. You could do it. You just have to move your hand really fast. Because if you move your hand slow, you're not giving enough energy to the, the you know, the, the negative electrons are all around you. But if you move your hand normally, you're not, you're not giving them enough energy to overcome that energy gap, that 1 million volt energy gap. But if you move your hand fast enough, you could do it and, and you would excite those electrons and you would create positrons. And so if you have a million, elect, a million electron volt photon, then what would happen is, you, the photon would just be happily moving along. And then what you would see with your eye is suddenly the photon would disappear and then two particles would pop out of existence. And, a, and a, 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 a kind of language that people say is you would say that they were ripped out of the vacuum. They're ripped out of the vacuum because we just have vacuum, but suddenly these two particles just appear out of nothing. And so this is particle creation. This is creation of particles. And you've all heard of this before, you know, you guys all know that this happens, but you've probably never thought about it all that hard. Like, what does it really mean to have, you know, for that to happen? And so now this was the first time that this concept of particle creation is actually put on firm theoretical footing. This is hardcore, you know, we're doing hardcore physics here, you know, we're solving equations, like, you know, we were, we're making actual predictions. And so uh, what, what 
what Dirac did was he made a firm prediction. He said, if you have a million volt photon, then I predict that that million volt photon will create an electron and a positron, this new concept of an antiparticle out of the vacuum, out of nothing. That was his prediction. And he was right. <laughs> this was observed in 1932 by some dude named Carl Anderson who got the Nobel Prize for, for observing it. And I think it was using a uh, cloud chamber. So this guy, Carl Anderson, uh, made a cloud chamber and he saw this happen and he got a Nobel Prize. And of course, Dirac got a Nobel Prize too. But I just want you, but, you know, but I just want you to sort of uh, appreciate this for a second, you know, that, you know, look how far we came. All we did was we just said the Hamiltonian is proportional to momentum. That's all. That's the starting point. And then suddenly, after a few lines of algebra, you realize, oh my God, million electron volt photons should create positron antiparticles. You know, it's like, how do you go from just saying that the Hamiltonian is proportional to momentum and then suddenly you have positrons? You know, it's freaky. And it's not just positrons, but we also got spin too. You know, it's like just really kind of extraordinary. And of course, the other thing can happen as well. Because look, suppose I have a positron here and an electron here. That electron can fall, right? And when that electron falls, he gives off a million electron volt photon, but then he fills that hole. And so basically what that means is that the electron and the positron come together and they create a photon. But what happens to the electron and the positron? What happens to them? What do they do? What, do they, what have they done? Where do they go? What happens to them? Tell me. Are they still there? What happens to them? What do you see if you're watching this? If you're Carl Anderson and you're watching this process in a cloud chamber, what do you see? What happens to the electron and the positron? Tell me. They disappear. Yeah, exactly. They're gone. <laughs> They're gone. And the, I think the technical term is that they uh, annihilate. And that's why you, that's another reason why you can now think of the whole as the antiparticle, because, you know, it, you guys already know that, like, if a particle and an antiparticle meet, then they, boom, they blow up, right? You know, you know that from like Star Trek, you've known that since you're a little kid. And this is, and, and it's true. If a particle meets an antiparticle, boom, you know, they blow up. But what does that mean they blow up? Well, the reason they blow up is because the part, the antiparticle is a hole and the particle falls into the hole. It plugs up the hole, but when it falls down, it emits a photon and that's like a big burst of energy. So that's the annihilation. Okay, so, um, all right, so that's enough of that. So now let's 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 do something um, else. Let's let's consider. Let's ask. Let's okay. So that's all I want to talk about: particles, antiparticles. But let's go. I just, but let's take all of these concepts one step further, and let's ask ourselves: What happens if I have an electron? And what happens if I turn on a magnetic field? What happens when we turn on a magnetic field? Okay. And so let's ask ourselves, what happens when you turn on a magnetic field? Does it, can, can the electron feel the magnetic field? What, what happens? So let's do this. Um, let's, let's, we're not, I'm not going to solve the Dirac equation, but let's, well, let's, let's manipulate it. Let's, let's take a close look at the Dirac equation and see what happens. Okay, and, and what we're gonna get is, what we're gonna derive is we're gonna derive the G factor, G equals two, and we're gonna derive the Zeeman effect, negative mu dot B, where mu is equal to uh, G Q over two M S, right? 
if I have a particle with charge Q, then I told you that it's uh, that the magnetic moment of that particle is G Q over 2m, where for an electron G is 2. So let's derive that. We can derive that. We're going to derive it right now. This is the we're going to derive the Zeeman effect. Derive the Zeeman effect. It's not hard. We can derive it, and we can get and we can get G equals 2. And it's really simple. So let's do it. Uh, so let's write down. So we have a magnetic field. So B, let's turn on a magnetic field, okay? Now, in quantum mechanics, dealing with magnetic fields is very tricky because it's not completely trivial to write down the energy of a particle in a magnetic field, you know, like the moving particle. It's not, it's not completely obvious. And so without getting into all those subtleties, Let's just jump to the answer. And the answer is that when you have a magnetic field, then in quantum mechanics, and this is true for non-relativistic quantum mechanics as well as relativistic quantum mechanics. For quantum mechanics, the way, we, the way we deal with magnetic fields is through the vector potential. And that's why the concept of vector potential is very useful. In classical mechanics, the vector potential is, I, I think is not that useful to be quite honest. But in quantum mechanics, it's totally useful. So that's why it's useful to learn the concept of vector potential. So in quantum mechanics, the momentum of a particle, if it's a charged particle and you put it in a magnetic field, then the momentum goes to, does anybody know? Can anyone tell me? Do you guys know? Uh, yeah, it goes like P minus E over C times the vector potential. Good, exactly. And it depends which uh, unit system you're, you're dealing with. but in my unit, the unit system that I'm using, uh, which is the SI units, it's just gonna be P minus QA, where A is the vector potential, where B is equal to del cross A. That's the definition of the vector potential. Okay, so hopefully you've all seen the vector potential, and if you haven't, well, that's what it is. <laughs> this is something that you learn in physics 110A. Um, okay, so that's classical physics, definition of the vector potential. And, uh, and so what we do then is, what does an electron do in a magnetic field if it's relativistic? Well, let's solve this, the Dirac equation. So in the Dirac equation, we just do this. We say the Hamiltonian of that electron is equal to C times alpha, where that's a known, this is like this weird four by four matrices, uh, dotted in to P. But now P gets replaced by Q times A. And then I go plus, beta mc squared. Okay, so that's my Hamiltonian, where p, of course, is our old friend, del. Okay, so that's the Hamiltonian for the, elect for the electron in the magnetic field. And so now let's solve the Dirac equation. So let's solve the Dirac equation, which is h psi equals e psi. And we're going to have, uh, we're going to, um, assume that psi is a, is a, we know that psi is a four-dimensional object. And now we know what those dimensions are. It's the positive and it's the spin up and spin down of the positive and negative energy solutions. Um, and then H psi <coughs> is equal to E psi, right? So it's an equation, we gotta solve it. Let's, so let's take a look, a closer look at it. Um, and then let's do this. So, we, and let's let's remind ourselves that uh, you know alpha is equal to um, remember zero sigma sigma zero uh, and uh, beta is equal to i zero zero minus i okay where i is the two dimensional identity matrix okay so that's the that's the equation. And let's solve that equation. So to solve it, let's do a, a little trick, a little mathematical trick <clears throat> to make the algebra easier. Let's just define um, psi is equal to chi phi, where um, chi is a two-dimensional vector. This is just to make the notation easier because you can see the notation is very tedious, all these four-dimensional things. So people have developed tricks for making it easier. Psi three, psi four. 
So you can see that this is sort of like the positive energy part and this is like the negative energy part. So you guys kind of see that? I'm just breaking it up. Uh, you know, it's just notation. And so now let's solve the equation. And I just want you to see that uh, these things commute. These operators commute because you know P is like the del operator and, and alpha is like this four by four matrix, they commute. So I can, I can change the order. And so I'm gonna change the order. So I'm gonna rewrite that equation like this. C times uh, P minus QA uh, dot uh, alpha, but alpha I'm gonna write like this, zero sigma, sigma zero uh, <clears throat> times psi, which is chi phi is equal to, oh no, I'm not, not equal yet, plus beta uh, plus mc squared times beta, which is i zero zero i um, times chi phi equals E times chi phi. All right, that's the Dirac equation. Just, just solving it, just writing it out. Now let's actually solve it. So let's do this. So now I'm gonna, let's multiply it out. So I'm gonna turn this now into two equations. Let's turn it into two equations using by using matrix multiplication. <clears throat> because I got a little matrix, you know? So let's multiply out that matrix. You see, it's like a two by two. So let's multiply it out. And so when we multiply it out, let's do the top first. From the top, we get, um, we do that top multiplication. And what we're gonna get is, um, um, C times P minus QA dot, sigma phi uh, plus, and now let's do that, the top row of, this, of the other matrix is gonna be mc squared chi is equal to e chi. And now I'm gonna do the matrix multiplication on the bottom, the bottom row. And on the bottom row, I'm gonna get C times P minus QA um, dot sigma chi plus, uh, not plus, it's gonna be minus, minus MC squared phi is equal to E phi. Now, do you guys see that? I just did matrix multiplication. And so it's not tricky, but you know, maybe you haven't done matrix multiplication in a while. Uh, I mean, if anybody want, needs me to explain that, just, just let me know. But, but I, so from the Dirac equation, we then got two equations. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this second equation and I'm gonna solve this one. I'm gonna, what I'm gonna solve for is I'm gonna solve for phi. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring um, this thing over to the other side and I'm gonna solve for phi. And so let's do that. And when I do that, I get phi is equal to C P minus Q A dot sigma over E plus M C squared. Okay, that's actually not so hard. And so now I'm gonna do another trick and I'm gonna plug this guy into here. Back in. So I'm gonna get rid of the phi. Now, why am I getting rid of the phi? Well, I don't want phi because phi is the negative energy solutions, you know, and, and for most non-relativistic processes, I don't need to deal with these negative energy solutions. I can just, they're all filled up and I don't need to worry about them. I'm not gonna be like creating positrons and all this 
So, you know, for normal stuff in the lab, I, I don't need to worry about that. So let's just get rid of it. So let's, let's take the phi and put it into that top equation. So now the top equation is only in terms of chi. Oh, I made a mistake here. This is chi. I have a chi right there. So I have, this is phi in terms of chi, okay? There's a relationship between phi and chi. So now I'm gonna plug it into that top equation. I'm gonna get rid of chi, plug, plug back in to get rid of phi. And when I get rid of phi in that top equation, it turns into this, C times P minus QA dot sigma times C P minus Q A uh, dot sigma all over E plus MC squared um, times chi plus MC squared times chi equals E times chi. Okay. And so, uh, so this is nice because now it's all, it's all in terms of the E greater than zero states. Which are the ones that I, I care about more for, you know, for a lot of stuff. So, okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, take the non-relativistic limit. And the non-relativistic limit just means that the energy uh, <clears throat> is um, uh, in the non-relativistic limit. What basically, what I'm saying is that um, you, you guys know that you know E is equal to uh, square root of p squared c squared plus m squared c to the fourth. And so then, in the non-relativistic limit, I just say that p goes to zero. And so then E is approximately equal to. Can you tell me what it is? P goes to zero, what's E? It's a famous equation. MC squared. Exactly. And so here I can, in the non-relativistic limit, I can replace that guy, that E with an MC squared. And so that means that this equation then turns into um, uh, on the left, and I can and I can multiply these guys out, right? So it, this it's this guy multiplies that guy on the right, and so basically, what I'm going to get is um, p minus q a dot sigma squared all over two m because the uh, m the c squareds cancel. The C cancels times chi is equal to E minus MC squared times chi. So I just brought one term over to the right. So, okay, so I'm just doing, all right, so I think that's pretty straightforward. I haven't done any tricks yet, uh, but I'm about to. Okay, so this part I think is pretty straightforward. We're just going through the math. It's some pretty simple algebra, but now I'm gonna do something very tricky. Trick, and it's a big trick. Uh, I'm going to use this poly, and I'm not going to go through all the details of it, poly uh, matrix identity. And this is the, the matrix identity, A dot sigma, where that's a vector, times B dot sigma, is, and, where, and where this is the poly matrices, is equal to, and this is not obvious, a dot b uh, plus i sigma dot a cross b. And um, now let's, for the a, let's plug in for the a, the momentum p. And for the b, let's plug in For the B, let's plug in the vector potential A. And if you do that, then you can show, um, then we can show, can show something that this equation turns into something else. 
and it sh can show, see the book by Leboff, Leboff, uh, fourth edition, problem 11.101. And when you look at that problem in the fourth edition of Leboff, then you'll notice that you can rewrite this equation, that top equation like this, one over two M, P minus QA um, squared times chi minus I Q over 2M sigma dot P cross A times chi is equal to E minus MC squared times chi. Okay. And so th that's a tricky step, all right? So I'm skipping, I'm skipping a bunch of algebra there, but it's, it's just algebra, it's just, just math, you know, it's a math identity. So I did not invoke all kinds of fancy physics and field theory and, and fancy stuff. It's just, it's just math, but it's just a bunch of tedious algebra that I wanted to skip. But, but using this Pauli matrix identity and going through the algebra, which is sort of alluded to in Leboff problem 11.101, Without too much work, you can show that that top equation is equal to the bottom equation. All right, and so I suggest that you all go look it up and figure out, you know, how to do that stuff. Um, but so let's just keep going. Uh, and so now let's notice something. Let's notice something, uh, and we'll notice that P cross A. Does anybody? Do you guys know what P cross A is going to give me? Remember P is H bar over I del. So P cross A is H bar over I del cross A. But what is that? What's that? Oh my God. Oh my God. What is it? So the magnetic field. That's exactly right. That's very cool. Uh, and so that means that I can rewrite that equation of pi like this. Uh, I can write it as um, one over two M P minus Q A squared uh, chi uh, minus Q H bar over two M sigma dot B times chi is equal to E minus MC squared times chi. Um, and now, and that's basically it. We're kind of done, but let's just, let's just notice some things. Let's notice that, um, let, let's notice that, let's define, let's make some def definitions. Let's define S is equal to h bar over two times sigma. And that's the definition of spin. <laughs> oh, look at that. Let's define that. Um, and then let's, if, let's define that. And then let's define, um, let's define mu is equal to, um, um, the, oh, the algebra right here. Let's define mu is equal to two Q over two M times S, okay? Just, just a simple little, you know, that's a definition. But of course this two is gonna get a name of, we're gonna call it G, but let's just call it two. It's, it's just a, the number two, <laughs> later we'll call it G, all right? Let's just call it two. So let's. So then we define those things, and we can see that we can rewrite that equation as one over two m p minus q a squared uh, chi minus. So let's get this all right. So it's going to be um, it's going to be um, plus negative mu dot b um, chi is equal to E 
<coughs> minus mc squared chi, where I have made, so, so these two equations are equal if I make these definitions. And so what we see is that the Dirac equation in a magnetic field reduces to this equation. And what is this? What is that thing? What is that? What is it? It's an interaction term. Yeah, it, 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 and we, we've dealt with it in this class. What's the name of that interaction term? What's the name of that interaction term? It has a name. Uh, Zeeman effect. It's the Zeeman term. We have just derived the Zeeman effect. Now, you know, we went through a bunch of math and it might just, you might just be wondering, wait, wait, how'd that happen? But it did happen. You know, we started with the, with the Dirac equation. We just did some very simple manipulations and suddenly, we got the Zeeman term. Not only did we get the Zeeman term, but we see that there's an, a new energy <clears throat> in the Schrodinger equation, which is uh, basically mu dot V. And what is mu? We just derived the magnetic moment. We just derived that an electron has a magnetic moment proportional to spin. Oh, oh my God, where'd that come from? And we also just derived that there's this G factor, the, the little factor of two, it's, it's in there. We just derived it. So we just derived all that stuff. And this is just the normal orbital effects. You know, that's just the normal orbital effects that, that will lead to, in quantum mechanics, that will lead to what we call Landau levels. Landau levels. But we don't need to worry about that. That's just normal quantum mechanics. But what we, so what we have is we've separated out the orbital part and the same and the spin part. So this is the orbital effect, but the Zeeman term is the spin effect. And so we just proved that electrons have a magnetic moment, and that the magnetic moment is you know proportional to spin, <laughs> and there's a G factor. And we did all that, and we did it all just by making the assumption that the Hamiltonian is proportional to momentum. That was all, that was the simple, that's the only assumption we made and all this stuff just fell out. So I really like that. That's why I like to do this uh, direct stuff at the end of this course, because you can sort of see where all this stuff comes from. Although it's complicated, you know, the math is, it's not that hard, but it's sort of like not very intuitive, you know, but it is what it is, it worked. Okay, folks, that's it. So that's the end of this course and uh, uh, I, I I will give you guys some information on the final, but I basically just want to say that the final is not meant to be cumulative. So I really want to put on the final, the stuff that is, uh, that was covered after the midterm, you know? And so the final is meant to be sort of like, I mean, the, you know, the, it's like the midterm was for an hour and a half test and the final is a three hour test. So in principle, you know, so the, the so the, the final is meant to be like, in, in terms of how big it is, it should be like, I don't know, 1.5 midterms or something like that, you know, like uh, not quite two midterms, but you know, it'll be like like of that magnitude. Um, and, and it will not be cumulative. And I, I wanna cover the stuff that came after the midterm. Although sometimes, you know, you can't help but have some leakage of the old topics into the new topics, but that, that's, that will be the emphasis of the, of the, of the final. Uh, any last questions? <clears throat> okay, folks. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Professor. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.